go ahead and um, read the next section, which talks a little bit about Paul's travels and then centers in Troas, uh, a worship service that uh, went rather long. And um, one young man who um, happened to be sitting in a windowsill fell uh, from the third story and died, and yet um, the Lord raised him again to life. This is uh, quite an interesting uh, worship service. So uh, let's read the text, and then we'll look at the three points I've already told you about. So after the uproar had uh, ceased in chapter 20, verse 1, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. When he had gone through those districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece, and there he spent three months. And when a plot was formed against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And he was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and by Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessal uh, Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. But these had gone on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. We sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came to them at Troas within five days, and there we stayed seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, for his life is in him. And when he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak, and then left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. Well, may the Lord bless uh, his word again to our understanding this evening. Now, remember this morning we were reminded that as God's kingdom moves forward, the kingdom of darkness uh, pushes back. The Lord was doing great things in Ephesus. Uh, the gospel was spreading throughout Asia. But as many turned to Christ and away from their former practices, it was having an impact on the economy of, of Ephesus. Uh, the silver shrines the craftsmen made of Artemis and her temple weren't selling quite as well as they were before. Uh, the church was threatening their livelihood, and so they started a riot that threatened the church. But we also saw that God in his mercy moved the heart of the magistrate to look at the issue through impartial eyes. Uh, the believers hadn't broken any laws, nor had they directly attacked their religion. Uh, this assembly really had no grounds for this unruly behavior. So cautioning them of the possible consequences this could bring on all of them, he dismissed them. And again, I just wanted to remind us that this is why the Lord has created government. Uh, this is what the Lord intends them to do, to praise those who do good and to punish those who do wrong. Paul and his companions were within the bounds of the law, so they were protected. But Demetrius and his mob, on the other hand, were not within the bounds of the law, and so they were liable to punishment. And in this case, it protected Paul and his companions. Government doesn't always do what it should do, but in this case, it did. But that's why the Lord tells us we should pray for our government, right? So that they will do what honors the Lord, so that we can do what it is the Lord calls us to do, live in peace and continue to spread the gospel. Now, after things had settled down, Paul called the disciples together to encourage them to remain steadfast to the Lord. And I, you know, I think we can imagine in, in this instance, he may have perhaps drawn on his own experience and perhaps you know, said to them, as he said to the disciples at Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, remember after he was stoned and left for dead and then the Lord raised him up and he went right back into the city where the people had, had dragged him out of and stoned him from. But he said to the disciples, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. 
Okay? It's not going to be an easy road. There's, there's going to be difficulties. There's going to be struggles. But the Lord is going to deliver us from all of them. Luke tells us that he then returned to Macedonia. Okay? Um, Macedonia from, um, let's see, at this point we're, uh, I forget, I think we're still in Ephesus. So he goes back across the, the, the sea. Macedonia is where Thessalonica and Berea were located. And then Luke says he goes to Greece. And Greece, by Greece here, he means Achaia, where both Athens and Corinth were located. And he, because he wanted to encourage them as well. Uh, after he had spent three months there, the Jews plotted against him. So then we read in verse 4 that he again returned through Macedonia, accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and Aristarchus, and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. He had basically this entourage of companions. Now the question is, why were these men accompanying him? Uh, some speculate that these likely were representatives of the various churches, and we see they do come from the various churches, that had been appointed to travel with Paul uh, to deliver the money that had been collected for the poor saints in Jerusalem. I remember reading about that in Scripture. As a matter of fact, uh, we're going to look at a passage in 1 Corinthians 16 as we go through this text. Uh, but Paul, remember, had purpose to go to Jerusalem. That's why he was thinking about going to Syria because Antioch's in Syria, and then he would go from there to Jerusalem. He was bringing this collection of money to help the saints because of the, the famine that was ongoing, which we'll see shortly in, in Acts 20. Now, when they came to, to Philippi, I don't know if you notice this, but the pronouns change again because Luke now joins them. Uh, Philippi is where Paul had left Luke on his second missionary journey to help establish the church that was there. And then after Paul sent his companions ahead to Troas, again, he's bouncing all over the map here. Troas is located north of Ephesus, still in Asia Minor, on the coast, uh, but you have Ephesus, then Smyrna, and then Troas. Um, he stayed in Philippi with Luke until the days of unleavened bread or the Passover were over. And I think this note is here to remind us that Paul as a Jew was still, you know, he still had um, respect for the Jewish feasts in a certain sense, keeping the feast, which was his right under the gospel. Then finally, he came to Troas with Luke, where they remained for seven days. And on the first day of the week, they met for worship with the saints. Now, this evening, what I want us to do is focus on this worship service and consider three things. The first is that it took place on the first day of the week, which, again, is important, as we saw a few weeks ago. What this gathering was called, you know, the breaking of the bread, why? And the way that God showed that He was with them, which, of course, was through this miracle. Now, first of all, let's consider the day that this worship took place, the first day of the week. Um, one thing we should note is that the last time Paul was in, in Troas, uh, which we read about in Acts chapter 16, not terribly long ago on the second missionary journey, this is where he received the vision of the man from Macedonia. Remember, he tried to go into Asia and the Lord wouldn't let him. But as he's praying, he sees this vision in the night of a man from Macedonia who's appealing to him to come over and help. But we didn't really read in Acts chapter 16 about, you know, the progress of the gospel. We hadn't read about any mention of a church, but at some point a church had been planted there, and we're not told exactly when or how. It might have been during Paul's first visit. I'm sure he didn't just, you know, end up going to uh, Troas and, and not sharing the gospel. He, he was likely there for more than a day. Perhaps it was formed uh, while he was there. Uh, his stay may have been longer than maybe it appeared in, in the, uh, uh, this book of Acts. Or it may have been the result of his ministry in Ephesus. Remember when the gospel was spreading throughout all of Asia? I mean, churches were planted where Really, there hadn't been any missionary activity by Paul. Remember the church at, at Rome uh, 
was uh, formed by believing Jews that had left, you know, Pentecost after they had been converted and then discipled and they returned home. They, they formed churches. It's, it's possible this church was formed by those who were taught by Paul during those couple of years he spent discipling uh, the, the believers in the school of Tyrannus. And I think that's interesting because we know these things took place. We don't always see the full effects of everything that Paul did in his ministry right away. Uh, the churches that he planted, they continued to grow and they continued to reach out with the gospel as well. And the effects of what Paul did are actually still reverberating today. You know, it, his, his ministry is still bearing fruit. We need to remember that the same thing could be true of us as well. You know, think again about that classic example about the man who got up to preach in a pinch uh, on that snowy day and Spurgeon happened in there and he was unconverted and the man was struggling to preach and, and in that ministry the Lord converted Spurgeon and then Spurgeon went on to do all that he did. Well, the man who was used as an instrument of the Lord to, to bring Spurgeon to saving faith also got to share in the reward, the fruit of what his efforts actually brought about. And I think the same thing is happening here with, with Paul. And we need to remember again that the things we do for the Lord could start a chain reaction that reaches into the future. I think that's one of the reasons why the day of judgment doesn't take place when we die and, and go to heaven. We're not judged immediately. But it takes place at the end of history when everything is said and done because what we have done may still be bearing fruit that will actually work together for our reward on that particular day. So that's another reason why we should uh, look for opportunities and take advantage of them when they come. Not just because the Lord tells us to do this, although that's a very you know, primary reason, but because of rewards. That's an incentive that God gives us and we should... You know, let that incentive move us. Well, Paul and Luke now gather with these saints to encourage them. We read on in verse 7, on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Now, why did they gather on the first day of the week? when the Jewish practice was to do so on the seventh day of the week. And we know from the scriptural record that the apostles, the disciples, would go to the synagogues on the seventh day of the week, on the Jewish Sabbath. But we know they were going there primarily to evangelize, okay? But they were meeting on the first day of the week. Well, I thought this would be a good time just kind of to review a little bit of what we've seen before. Remember, the believers knew that there was a fourth commandment, right? They knew there were ten commandments. And they knew the fourth commandment required the keeping of the Sabbath. And that God had given them this day that was common for all of them so that they could meet together for worship. But the commandment itself did not tell them which day of the week. Remember, it simply says work six days and rest on the seventh. But God has to tell us outside of the commandment which day they were to keep. From creation, he showed them that they were to rest on the seventh day of the week because it was the day he rested, uh, ceased from his works of creating, and the day also that he looked at all that he had made and, and was basically uh, pleased with what he saw and refreshed by his work and said that it was all good, all very good. But we remember the creation was destroyed by Adam's sin. Basically, the Bible represents the creation as being what it was before God had formed everything into this orderly universe. Uh, and when Jesus comes into the world, his work of redemption is not just to save individuals, but it's really to redeem the whole of creation. Jesus has brought a new creation through his redemptive work. So now they understood that they were to observe this day of rest on the day that Jesus entered into his rest, which was the first day of the week. And the reason why I continue to read this passage from the author to the Hebrews who tells us there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his, which is what Jesus did 
on the day of his resurrection and why the early church was observing the first day of the week. Now, I mentioned earlier that Paul's companions were likely those representatives chosen by the different churches to deliver the money that had been collected for the saints at Jerusalem. Paul talks about that collection in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, and he tells us when the collection was actually taken. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. Paul is basically saying on the first day of the week, you are to set a certain amount of money aside and on that day you are to give it you know, so that there won't need to be a collection when I come. They weren't just store it in their homes. It had to be given. And that's what Paul's implying here. But why on the first day of the week? Well, it's because that is when they were meeting together to worship. This is the church of Corinth. Okay? This is the church that Paul had planted in Achaia. And we've just read about that ministry not too long ago. But again, this is why the church has met on the first day of the week through the centuries and why we continue to do so today. Now, another point of interest here, I think, is how long this service actually lasted. Okay? Luke tells us that Paul prolonged his message until midnight. Now, that seems like, you know, that could be a very long time, regardless of when it actually begins, right? Now, when is midnight? Midnight is, it really means the same thing for them that it means for us. It means the middle point of the night. And when you consider when the sun goes down and when the sun rises, it's right in the middle. So it's roughly 12, 12 midnight, you know, depending upon, you know, what time of the year it is and I suppose where you are, you know, in the world. Now, Luke goes on to tell us that Paul went beyond this, right? It was just at midnight, something happened, and we're going to look at that in, in just a moment. But that Paul continued until daybreak. Now, one commentator calculated that at that time of the year, remember we, we heard that Paul had just celebrated the Feast of, of Unleavened Bread, okay? That's the time of Passover. And noting the location, Troas, and where that is on the globe, right? that the sun at that time of the year set at 7 p.m. and rose at about 5 a.m., which means, let's see, what do you have here? You've got 10 hours, <laughs> 10 hours of darkness, which could very well mean that the service lasted somewhere between 8 and 10 hours. It was probably closer to, to 8 hours. Now, that sounds, you know, like something that we would not want to endure, but we need to remember that that is not always the way people thought about worship services. It wasn't uncommon in the days of the Puritans for services to last three hours, and some of them, like uh, John Howes, to last for six hours, you know, where he might preach for three hours, uh, they might sing for an hour, he might pray for an hour. Uh, sometimes he would sit down and, and basically rest while the congregation sings, you know, and He'd, they'd sing for an hour and he'd get to rest and then he'd get up and maybe pray for an hour and preach for three hours. And, and they were all in, engaged in this. So as I said at the beginning, next time we think the service is running a little bit long, you know, just, just remember that examples like this where the people were hungry, hungry for the word. Now, as to why the service was running so late at night, I think there's something else that maybe we should take into account. And that is assume that the early church was using the Jewish reckoning of days at that time, which means that the first day of the week would begin at sundown. So this is probably not a service that began in the morning and went all the way till midnight and then to daybreak. It wasn't a 24-hour you know, service. But it probably started shortly after, after sundown. And uh, that's why it went as late as it did to midnight. But then, of course, Paul's particular situation, the fact that he was traveling, made it go perhaps even, even longer. Uh, but again, think about you know, how they, uh, these believers were, you know, were up for a pretty long time. Now, second, I want us to notice what Luke calls 
their worship. Again in verse 7, on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. Now, Luke is not really telling us here that this was a missionary presentation and they had a fellowship meal prepared and that that's what this breaking of the bread was. But he's telling us that they had actually gathered together for worship. Uh, in verse 11, he says this, and this is after the, the um, incident with Eutychus. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. Now, the breaking of the bread in the book of Acts refers to the Lord's Supper. And the breaking of the bread is what we call a synecdoche, which means a part for the whole. The bread is representing the bread and the wine. But even beyond that, the bread is actually being used as a part of the whole worship service. The worship service came to be known as the breaking of the bread. When Paul writes to the Corinthians to correct their abuse of this sacrament. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20, Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, notice he's implying that when they, do, when they meet together, it should be to celebrate the table because that was something that accompanied every worship service. Now, that's really the point. The early church celebrated the table every time they met together. You know how there's all these debates about how often should we celebrate the Lord's table? Some churches believe we shouldn't do that at all. It was a sacrament meant just for the early church, and it's been done away with. Obviously, we don't believe that. Uh, some believe once a year. Some believe once a quarter, maybe every two months, every one month, maybe twice, you know, twice a month. But we do it every, every Lord's Day. And actually from this, maybe as, as uh, BJ had mentioned earlier, maybe we should be having it every service because that's what the early church seemed to be doing. But that's why the breaking of the bread became synonymous with worship. And that's why we break that bread at least once every Lord's Day. So we have to see here that the early believers, they enjoyed listening to long sermons. You know, they didn't have <laughs> any you know, problem with that. And they also enjoyed meeting with the Lord around His table every week. You know, uh, when we first instituted the Lord's Supper every week several years ago, there were members of the church, uh, none of which are here now, that um, really had a problem with that because they said if we celebrate the Lord's Supper every, every week, it's going to lose its significance. Right? We're gonna, it's just going to become rote, and we have to be careful it doesn't. But is that true of the other elements of worship? You know, if we pray every week, is that going to make prayer meaningless? If we you know, have the Word of God and a sermon every week, is, is that going to lose its significance as well? Well, it shouldn't, right? These are the ways that God has given to us to draw near to Him. And so we should look forward to those things. And, and I think we do by God's grace. Now, finally, we see the miracle that reminded them that the Lord was, was with them. We read in verses 9 through 12, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, do not be troubled, for his life is in him. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while after, until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. Uh, I was listening to R.C. Sproul on this, um, particular, sir, on this particular text, and he pointed out that the subtitle of this, of this uh, really text could be the dangers of falling asleep in church, <laughs> right? Um, it could be precarious, depending upon where you're sitting, at least, okay? Now, obviously, not everybody could stay awake for this long. I already mentioned, you know, Paul had been speaking by this time for about four or five hours, really. Um, by the time midnight had rolled around, and this was after his audience had already been awake during the daylight hours. You know, I, I think there was only one time in my life that, that I stayed up, 
for more than the, the 24 hour time frame, well, maybe two and went to Germany. I think we, no, oh, no, I couldn't count that. But anyway, you, you, you begin to feel, you know, just really different, you know, kind of like uh, you're, you're burning inside and your eyes want to close. It's, it's very difficult. But remember, these Jews, uh, Jewish believers, some of them had already celebrated the Jewish Sabbath perhaps, and uh, now we're going into the, the second day, but they had been at least awake for all the daylight hours, and now they're meeting uh, for this evening meeting that's going on until the wee hours of the night. And as it went on, Eutychus falls asleep. Now Luke tells us that he was a young man. Now, the word that's used here usually refers to somebody who's past puberty, which means about 13 years of age, but not yet of marriageable age, which in that time and that culture, though it could take place really any time after puberty, usually they believe they were ready for it around 18. You know, in, in our society now it's 38. Okay. <laughs> We take longer to mature, okay? But, okay, so he was, he was a relatively young man. Now, if he was anything like the young men in our day, his interest levels might not have been really high enough to keep him on the alert. Now, the sad part was where he was sitting, in the windowsill on the third floor. Now, it's not that this was a big hollowed-out building and that from the first floor you could see the third floor. It's likely they were having the service on the third floor. He may have been sitting in the windowsill to get some fresh air so that he could stay awake. But apparently it wasn't enough. As he sunk into a deep sleep, Luke tells us he fell out of the window, likely all the way to the ground floor, and in the process, he was killed. Now remember, Luke was there, and he was a physician. I imagine he was probably the first one to examine Eutychus, and he found or confirmed that the boy was dead. But when Paul understood what had happened, he went down to him from the third floor down to the uh, ground floor. Again, I think indicating that Eutychus probably fell outside the window and, and hit the ground on the outside of the building. Then, like Elijah did with the widow of Zarephath's son, remember when he died, how he stretched himself out on that boy and prayed. Paul stretched himself out on this boy and embraced him, and the boy's life returned. Now this not only of course comforted those who knew him, but it also confirmed that God was with Paul and that the words that he was speaking were God's words. And by the way, that miracle also tells us why we should receive what Paul writes for us in, in the Word of God, in the epistles, as the Word of God. Now one last thing, we could also look at this as a picture of what the Lord does spiritually right? Um, through the gospel, he raises people to life. Sometimes we're hesitant to share the truth with other people because we know in their spiritual condition that they're going to reject it because they're spiritually dead. They're actually enemies of God. But through the gospel, the Lord does spiritually what he did to Eutychus here. He raises the dead to spiritual life, and he makes them want to trust in his Son. Now, let me just submit to you, that's the reason, one of the reasons, not, not the only reason, why Paul was never afraid to share the gospel, because he knew God did great things through the gospel. God didn't do great things if he didn't share the gospel. He did great things when you share the gospel, and that's why Paul shared it. That's why he wasn't afraid to share it, because he knows that that's how God works. And so this is just, I think, yeah, again, a picture, a reminder to us that we shouldn't be afraid either because that is what the Lord does when we share the gospel with others. Well, may the Lord encourage us again in the many different ways we've seen through this text um, to trust Him and, and to follow Him, to honor Him. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord's help to do that. <clears throat>